open this meeting with prayer. Our Father, we do bow in thy presence, the start of this meeting tonight, to thank thee, first of all, for the Lord Jesus, forever giving the very best of heaven for us, poor lost sinners in our sins. We thank thee that God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. We thank thee for everyone that has listened to these meetings, both saved and unsaved. Bless thy people and bless those that are not saved with thy salvation. No greater blessing is there than to know sins forgiven and peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we pray tonight, Lord, that there would be those that started these meetings without Christ, that by the time this meeting is over, that thou wouldst open their hearts and that they would receive the Lord Jesus as their Savior. Speak to them, we do pray. Help us to speak kindly, compassionately, and seriously to them tonight, we pray. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen. We're going to just read one text of Scripture for my final message tonight, and that's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Second Corinthians chapter six and verse number two. For he saith, that is the spirit of God saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. In the day of salvation, I have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Let's read it again with some explanation. For he said, the Spirit of God said to Isaiah, 750 years before this, this is what he said, I have heard thee in an accepted time, and in the day of salvation have I succored or helped thee. Isaiah chapter 48, is it? 49 and verse 8. I was going to say 48 and verse 9. 49 and verse 8. That's what it says. God said through Isaiah, who was a prophet, who was prophesying of a day to come, he said, I have heard thee, in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee. That's an exact quote from Isaiah. You know what God added here by the Spirit? He said, behold, now is that accepted time. Behold, now is that day of salvation. Remember Isaiah way back there talking about a time accepted? And a day of salvation? Well, look here, he says. It's now. Look here. This is that time. This is that day of salvation. It's a wonderful day. You don't have to raise your hands or anything, but how many of you listening to us tonight, over these last nine or ten weeks of shut-in have got the days mixed up. What day is today? Yeah, we all have. Is this Monday? No. No, this is Saturday. This isn't Saturday. That conversation has taken place in this house. What are you doing? Tomorrow's Sunday. No, no, dear. Today is only Friday. Oh, really? Yeah, we've got the days because our schedules were thrown off. School is off. We're just, we're in the house and one day blended into the next and we got the days mixed up. Now stop. That's nothing. But don't lose sight of this day. Don't mix up these days. Right now is the day when God's ear is open to our cries. This is the accepted time when God is listening. There's a day coming when he won't listen. Don't mix up those two days. 
Now he'll hear you. Then he won't. Ye shall call and I will refuse. Now is that day when God is listening. But he goes further and he says, look here. Now is the day of salvation. There's a day coming when it's going to be the judgment day. The day of judgment. Don't mix up those two days. Now is the time when God will save you. That day, there's no salvation. That's what he's saying here. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. So I don't expect you to remember this. So I plan to tell you this tonight. On Thursday night, I spoke on the little expression, once for all. And we were speaking of one acceptable person, one accepted sacrifice. This man, the Lord Jesus Christ, after he had made one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, once for all, never to be repeated again. From Hebrews 10 and 10, the once for all offering of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. One accepted person. On Friday night, I spoke to you about one accepted way. And we talked from Luke 18 about a man who was told by the Lord Jesus, sell all that thou hast. And come and follow me. And the little expression I used was all or nothing. All or nothing. We learn from that there's one accepted way of salvation. Just one. It's Christ or nothing. It's all total dependence on him and his finished work. It's turning from all sin. It's getting rid of everything else and simply trusting Christ. All or nothing. So, you can guess what I'm speaking on tonight. Because the force of the word that's used here, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Is the third thing that the Bible makes clear. Once for all, all or nothing, now or never. And I think it's only fitting for the last night of a series of eight weeks to tell you what God says, now or never. That's the force of the word. Now is the day of salvation, because there's a day coming when you will never be saved. Now is the accepted time when God's ear is open because there's a day coming when his ear will be closed to your cries. Now or never. And from this we learn, thank God, there is an acceptable time. An acceptable person, an acceptable way, and an acceptable time. If you've learned nothing else from all that I have tried to preach to you, learn those three things. There is one acceptable person. There is one way of salvation. There is one acceptable time. There is one acceptable person. This is the stone which was rejected of you builders, which has become the head of the corner, and neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. One acceptable person. One acceptable way. All that you have. Let it all go. And trust Christ. And tonight, one acceptable time. Each night that I've spoken on these expressions, I've tried to explain to you why. Why? 
one acceptable person? Why one acceptable way? Tonight, why, why one acceptable time? Well, you don't have to look very far from your own nature to know why. The first reason is human nature. Because of human nature, something happened when we fell into sin that made us, I sometimes shorten my name to John Pro because people can't say Procopio, and I don't mind being called a pro. So John Pro. But there's something that made us all pros, procrastinators, all of us. Human nature has made us all professional procrastinators. We can put off. It's human nature. It's your nature. It's my nature. It's the nature of children. You will put off God's salvation. You will constantly, you know you need to be saved, but you'll put it off. It's older people that are listening. We thank you for listening every night. And you, you've been most patient with us. And you've sat there and you've listened. And yet, you're doing the same thing. You're a professional procrastinator. Human nature is such that we just want to wait. We just want to go beyond the deadline. We just want to put it off till some other time. Shelf it. I'll have a better time. A more convenient season is the New Testament way. But the Old Testament has one, one classic example of what human nature is like. Absalom, David's son, rebelled against him. And he appointed a man named Amasa to be his general in the rebellion. After the rebellion was put down, to make a long story short, David showed mercy to Amasa. And he said, I know, Amasa, you were led astray by my son, a rebel son. But you're a good man. And I want to make you captain of my army. Go assemble the armies of Israel together and be back at my palace in three days' time. Okay, he said. And he left. But Amasa goes down in history and in the scriptures as the man that tarried longer than the appointed time. The time set for him by the king. That's what verse 5 of 2 Samuel 20 says. A mesa tarried longer than the set time. Three days be back here. Because the king knew he didn't have four days. He only had three. Not four, three. And on the fourth day, the man is on the road heading to the palace. And coming out from the palace is his enemy. And he killed him on the road to the palace. One day too late. The scripture doesn't tell us why he was a day late. It just says this. But Amasa tarried longer than the set time. That's the, that's the example. That's the sterling example of every sinner that's putting off God's salvation. And God says, in light of Amasa, in light of this man that waited one day too long, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. I don't know what his intentions were. I don't know what your intentions are. It seems his intentions were good. I'll get back to the king. But he tarried longer. Maybe your intentions are to be saved. In fact, I see some of you children sitting here tonight. And you have every intention of being in heaven, not in hell. You intend to be saved like your parents. Some of you older ones, you intend to be saved before you die. This man intended to be in the king's army. He was heading for the palace, but he was too late. That's why God says, now is the day of salvation. Because of human nature. We procrastinate. But secondly, because of the nature of sin. You see, 
You and I have human natures, but we also have a sinful nature, a nature that's stained by sin, and sin is not controlled by you. You are controlled by it. Sin has a nature of its own. Sin has a mind of its own. Sin has a way of its own. And because of the very nature of sin, God says it must be now. It must be now or never. Because sin doesn't get easier, it gets harder. Sin does, ever, does never get better, it gets worse. Sin never gets weaker, it gets stronger. Sin never gives you more light, it gives you less light, it gets darker. The very nature of sin is leading downward, darker, stronger in sin. So children, listen tonight. While you're young and tender in age, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, the scripture says, before the evil day comes. What's it talking about? Before the time comes when you grow up in your sins and sin is so strong that you have no control. Because of the very nature of sin, it must be now. There will never be a better time to be saved than right now. Sin's very nature demands it. Because if you give sin time, listen now, I'm going to say it again. If you give sin time, it will kill you. Time given to sin, it will kill you. Sin, when it's finished, James tells us, brings death. Time is all sin needs, and it will kill you. So God says, not time, now. Now is the day of salvation. You just stay in your sins long enough, you will die in your sins. And the tragedy, oh, my friend, the awful tragedy of dying in your sins is the Lord Jesus said, if you die in your sins where I am, you cannot come. No if, ands, or buts about it. You cannot come. Because of human nature, it's now. Don't put it off. Because of the very nature of sin, you'll die in your sins. It will kill you. It is now. But because of the uncertainty of life, Life changes. Right now, you are listening to the gospel. You won't be listening to it tomorrow night. But right now, you are. Right now, you have thoughts about eternity. You will not tomorrow night. Right now, you're under the sound of, of the greatest message under the, under, under the sun. The message of salvation, God's great salvation. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. But time changes. Life changes. Health changes. You know that. Circumstance change. Opportunities come and go. Life gets complicated. Yes, the Lord Jesus spoke of this in the parable of the sower, and he says, the cares of this life choke out the seed. Because of the very uncertainty, unchanging way of life, changeable way of life, I mean. Because of all that uncertainty, God says now, right now, while you have the opportunity, oh, what an opportunity you have to trust the Savior. I think of this verse, that tells me his ear is open. That's a marvelous thing that God's ear is tuned. You know what it's tuned to? He's just listening for the cry of some poor lost sinner. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You know what that means? That's the cry of a desperate sinner. Lord, I'm going down. Save me. Lord, I'm lost. Save me. He hears that cry. His ear is open. This is the day, the accepted time when God's ear is open. Have you cried? 
Would you cry out to him tonight? If you would, friend, you would be saved. That's what God says. Call unto me, and I will answer you. You won't call. Call in an acceptable time. Oh, yes. Cares intensify. Things get out of control. People, people get put into circumstances that are not their fault. That is life. Life has cruel edges to it. Things happen to us in life. And the, the mind is absolutely boggled with the cares of it. And, and, and even the, the choking, sobbing, Grief that some people are put through because of life. Life can be so cruel. Don't count on it. Life has been ruined by sin, and it will you will lose your soul if you allow the cares of this life and the uncertainty of this life to choke you. I can remember talking to a man in a hospital one time, and I had talked to him many times. I'm glad to tell you that the man got saved before he died. It was Uncle Stan. Uncle Stan Linstead. I was thrilled to hear that he got saved 48 hours or so before he passed away. But I can remember talking to Uncle Stan when his son Gary was dying of a brain tumor. And poor Stan was pulling out his hair. We were sitting down in the cafeteria at the hospital in St. John's. And he was just sitting there with his with his head in his hands. And I said, Uncle Stan, don't you think God is speaking to you? What, he said? I can't think about that now. Don't you know how, 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 how mixed up my mind is? Don't you know how confused my mind is? I can't think of that now. And I thought, oh, oh, how true that is. And he couldn't. He couldn't. Because the cares of this life had choked them, and they'll choke you. That's why God says, right now, right where you're sitting, right now is the day of salvation. This is the time to be saved. But there is one more I must remind you of. Not only because of human nature, not only because of the nature of sin and the uncertainty of life, but friend, the finality of death, it's so final. Death is so final. Here today, gone tomorrow. All you have is now. There's no coming back. Unlike your computer, there's no undo button. And there's certainly no redo button. People say, well, wouldn't God give me a second chance? God has given you a thousand chances, 10,000 opportunities. All of them are in this life, all of them. But once you pass your last hundred thousandth opportunity of salvation, there's no more. They're gone. So God in his mercy and grace says, look here, young man. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Look here, young woman. Behold, now is the accepted time. My ear is open. Is there not anything you need to tell me? I'm listening. Tonight. Now is the day of salvation. Because once you cross that line, wherever you are, you will be forever. Got it? Once you cross death's threshold, wherever you open your eyes, you will be forever. Either heaven or hell. So now, right now, 
before I turn this meeting over to my brother Brody for his last preach. Now is the accepted time. What grace God has to patiently hold his hand over his ear, as it were, and listen, and listen, now, now. Any response? Now is the day I will save you. Any response? That's what he's saying. Now or never. If you miss now, God only saves now. God would save you now. God has given you time to be saved right now. It is enough time, but it is all the time that you have. Take it now, my friend. Because remember, for you, it could be now or never. God bless you with his salvation. Amen. Now let's read together in the Old Testament, book of Isaiah, please. The book of Isaiah in chapter 1. The book of Isaiah chapter 1, we'll read a couple of verses beginning at verse number 18. So that's Isaiah chapter 1 and verse number 18. From the beginning, this is going to sound repetitive because we've been hearing about this. God says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, ye shall eat of the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. I would say, judging by John Pro's math, that we are now listening to gospel message number 100. Gospel message number 100. And while there have been many slight differences and nuances to the gospel every night, there are certain themes that always remain the same. One of which is this little phrase, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. The importance of the word of God in our gospel preaching is emphasized each and every night. As we go online, and, and we know not everyone who is listening, we are thankful for those who log into Zoom. We are thankful to those who uh, click on the YouTube link. Every night, there are about 250 different uh, devices logged on. I'm not going to guess how many people are listening on each device, but I will tell you this. On the ears of each person who listens every night is emphasized the importance of the Word of God. What does God say? What does God say about me? What does God say about God? What does God say about sin? What does God say about eternity? What does God say about death? What does God say about Christ? What does God say about salvation? What does God say? I want you to remember that as we are going through these verses tonight that we are going to talk about to end these gospel meetings. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. As we present the gospel consistent with the Bible, we are presenting to you the word of God. What does God say? While you could argue with the preacher, and many people do argue with the preacher, 
Sometimes the preachers are, are more into arguing than, than they are into preaching. Shame on them. But you can argue with a preacher. You might be smarter than the preacher. This preacher you might be a lot smarter than. You can argue with the Sunday school teacher. You can argue with all of those trolls online trying to get all your response every time they, they post a little controversial comment or question, right? And you get sucked in, of course, and you spend hours and hours responding to someone who may not even be who they say they are. You can argue and argue and argue and argue, but you cannot argue with God. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Throughout the course of these meetings, we know that the mouth of the Lord has spoken this. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The mouth of the Lord has spoken that. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The mouth of the Lord has spoken that. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life. The mouth of the Lord has spoken that. You cannot argue with that. Christ died for the ungodly. You cannot argue with that, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Christ died for our sins. He was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The mouth of the Lord has spoken this. Christ died for us. Can't argue with those statements. The mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Now, I know you are reasoning in your mind, and I know you are going in circles, and whatever it is that's holding you up, whether it be the idea of faith, whether it be the idea of, of sin, whether it be the idea of punishment, whatever it is that's holding you up, remember this. Every mouth is stopped, and every argument is moot. When we know that the mouth of the Lord has spoken this. Perhaps there's even someone who's listening to this and you heard the gospel as a little child and you've grown up in the gospel and gotten away and you think, well, surely the Spirit of God has ceased to strive with me. Sometimes we need to go over theology, I think. But surely the Spirit of God has ceased to strive with me and I had my opportunity and it's all over now. No! You know what the mouth of the Lord speaks to you tonight? Directly from the Bible, God says, come now. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Perhaps there is someone, and I'm going to get into my message here after this one, I think. I never know for sure. You understand that, right? Flip a coin, see what happens. Perhaps there's somebody who's rebelled against God openly. Now, I know that all of you as sinners have rebelled against God, and all of you have revolted against God, but perhaps tonight you're far away from home, you're far away from family, you're far away from your mother and father who only prayed for you and wanted what was best for you, you're far away from any place that you would say would preach the gospel, and you think that you've rebelled against God to the point where God doesn't want you anymore, but remember, the mouth of the Lord says this, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. You see, because it is to a rebellious people that God speaks these words in the direct context of Isaiah chapter 1. He talks about, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. A rebellious nation. Why shall you be stricken anymore? Why do you revolt more and more? You see, these people were in active rebellion against God. They were denying his truth. They were trying to run from his presence. They didn't want him in their midst. They wanted nothing to do with the God of heaven, the God of creation, the God of power, the God of promise. They wanted nothing to do with him on his terms. And yet to a rebellious, revolting people, he says, come. But come now. Does that sound familiar to you tonight? Come. They weren't just a rebellious people, though, you'll understand. 
They were also a religious people who had taken their religion to a point where God was no longer in it. And God says, and even the solemn feast, it's all iniquity, the solemn day, the day of restraint, the offerings and the oblations and all of those things that used to mean something because you are doing them as a rebellious people and you refuse to bow to my word and you refuse to come, they're an abomination to me. But to a rebellious, revolting people, he says, come. And to a religious people who have chosen to make themselves feel good with ritual rather than to have God in their midst, he says, now, I know you've done that. And I know you've done that. I know everything you've done. I know everything you've thought. I know the words that you say in private. I know the thoughts that you think. And I know the thoughts that you thought. Back there when you were just a teenager and you thought, if only I could get out of my parents' house, I would be happy. I wouldn't have to go to gospel meeting. I wouldn't have to go to the morning meeting. I wouldn't have to see those Christians. I wouldn't have to listen to that old dry preaching and that terrible squeaky singing, and I'll be able to do whatever it is that I want. You might have thought that. But God still loves you. He still wants you. And he says, come now and let us reason together. And perhaps there's someone, in, in, and you know that your empty religion is not doing anything for you. You're holding on to it because for some reason it makes you feel good. And you know that going to church is not going to get you to heaven, but you go because of the people in your religion you're worried about what they might say. And you know that none of this could ever satisfy God. And still you go on away from God in religious emptiness. And God says, I understand that. I despise it. It's sin in my eyes, but I still want you. So come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. The idea of reasoning together is not negotiation, my friend. God is not inviting you to the negotiation table so that he can compromise and save you. No such thing. There is no compromise in the character of God, even though he reaches out to sinners. There is no compromise in the ways of God, even though he can accept rebellious religious sinners. The idea of reasoning together here sometimes has been put forward to let's discuss this. Let's, let's, let's come together. But there, there is, I would say, a real sense in which God is saying this. Come now. Let's discuss your options. Come. Are you scared? Are you afraid to face what God has to say? You know, that sometimes happens, doesn't it? Sinners hear the gospel, try and drown out the voice of God. Not because they don't like the preachers, although sometimes they don't, and maybe they don't like the people at the gospel hall. That's all fair. Some of us are weird and some of us are cranky. That's, that's just life, okay? But when God speaks, sometimes you pull back because you're scared to face the truth that God has to show you. Come now, let me show you your options. Really, the options are after this verse, aren't they? I, I'll go to it right now. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. Now, this would be literal for the children of Israel. I think you should understand that when you listen to the news also, okay? 
And you listen to the news and you find a conservative commentator who uses verses from the Old Testament to say that North America is going to receive blessing from God as soon as we elect a Christian prime minister or a Christian president. That's taken out of context. It's not a promise from God. We are not going to see this nation turn around and be blessed because of a spiritual revival in government. That's not the promise in the Old Testament. Now, if you, if you don't agree with that, you have my email. What's going on here is that God is speaking directly to the nation of Israel. It is literally, if you're willing and obedient, you come and you're willing to bow to my word, you indeed will experience the blessing of the land. That was literal and physical to Israel. If you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. That was literal and physical for Israel. But it is also, for us, very emblematic or symbolic. The idea of eating of the good of the land is the blessing of God. The blessing of God upon sinners. Absolutely. God desires beyond anything else to extend an arm of salvation that brings tremendous blessing. In the case of the nation of Israel, it would bring the blessing of the land, the good of the land. But in the case of a sinner tonight, it brings eternal life, brings the forgiveness of sins. It brings peace with God. It brings a relationship with God as your father. It brings you out of your sins and in Christ. For if you die in your sins, the Lord Jesus says, where I am, you cannot come. But if you're found in Christ, it's impossible to die in your sins. All of these things God has for you as he extends an arm of blessing in salvation. And if you're willing and you bow to the word of God, you'll receive every spiritual blessing. But it says here, if you refuse and rebel, there's only judgment. So now here we are. The word of the Lord or the mouth of the Lord has spoken this. Come now and let's discuss your options. You only have two options. I am completely willing, God says, to bless you. I desire to bless you. It would delight God to show mercy. You know that's found in the Bible, right? God delights in loving kindness and mercy. And it would bring delight to the heart of God tonight if you were willing and he could bless you. That's option number one. That's a tremendous option. But if you want to have it, you must come now. Option number two is if you are not willing and you refuse. But remember, you will do one of these two things tonight. And you say, that's just an old preacher saying. No, it's not. It's true. You will do one of these two things tonight. You will either accept, be willing, or you will refuse and rebel. I've illustrated it this way before, where if, uh, if I had a $100 bill in my hand after a gospel meeting, and I held it out to you, extended my arm. Now, this is before COVID, and I don't have to put it on a six-foot stick now. I'm just extending it out, open, honest, you can see it. I can see it. We know what the terms are. I'm extending my hand out to give you a free $100 bill. If it was a US 100, it'd be a $136 Canadian. Here I am, extending my offer. Now, as you approach me at the door, you can do two things. You can reach out and be willing Take it. Or you can walk around me, avoid me, ignore me, neglect me. You can call it whatever you like, but if you walk past an open invitation, you walk past an outstretched hand with a blessing on the end of it, and you are saying, I refuse. No getting around it. 
And it's exactly the same thing tonight as God is holding out this tremendous blessing of salvation. He is saying, you come now, we'll discuss your options. I'm holding out this tremendous thing that you will, you will receive every spiritual blessing as soon as you receive Christ, because according to the Bible, the mouth of the Lord has spoken of it. He that hath the Son has life. We have gone over these things in past nights. If you had the opportunity to listen, you will remember that the moment you receive Christ, you get everything. There is no supplemental blessing after receiving Christ because the person who receives the Son gets every blessing at that very moment. Anyone else telling you anything else is lying or they're mixed up. When you have the Son, you have everything. He's extending an offer out. That offer is the Son. And within that person, there's everlasting life, eternal life, forgiveness of sins, all of those things. If you are willing... You take it. And if you don't take it, you don't have to say it. God knows. Well, they've refused. If you're willing the blessing. If you refuse, the judgment. The mouth of the Lord has spoken that. Come now, and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet. I've had this verse on the wall the whole time I've been preaching these eight weeks. They shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. So now you're looking, and you say, God says, come now, and I'll receive blessing. Come now, I'll receive blessing. But there are two different phrases that lie between come now and the blessing received. You see it if you're looking at your Bible. You will see at the beginning of verse 18, God says, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. And at the beginning of verse number 19, if you're willing, obedient, you shall eat of the good of the land. But what's in between? Sin. In. You're almost ready to press play and say, this is a recording. They're going to talk about sin again. I'm going to talk about sin and tell you tonight that you can have every single sin removed. Every single one. See, the tremendous thing is here is God is not inviting you to negotiate so that we can allow a little bit of sin and still bless you. God is calling to tell you, you only have two options. There is no negotiation. You take this or you take that. But here's what I'm willing to do. Though your sins be as scarlet. The idea of the scarlet here is a stain. Our brother mentioned this in the first part of his meeting. It's a stain that is on you. You will remember we have spoken of, of sin as a separation that's keeping you from God. A separation that is keeping you from God and will keep you from God for all eternity if you die in your sins. We have spoken of sin as that weight, that burden, that laboring that people experience when they understand that sin is exceeding sinful. That is, when they get light from God, from the Bible, and God reaches their conscience, and they begin, that sin bothers them. You know what I'm going to say next? Does your sin bother you yet? Does your sin bother you? Sin is a separation. Sin is a weight. But sin is a stain. And you know, no matter how hard people try to get the stain off by changing their life, they can never erase the past. And the Bible says that in the Old Testament, when those sacrifices were offered, it, it's the cleansing of the flesh. It's the cleansing of the outside. The purification of that which can be seen and defiled on the outside. So if a leper was to be cleansed, he's really uh, experiencing the ritualistic cleansing of the flesh. And on the Day of Atonement, when the offering was offered and the man came out with the blood and he sprinkled all of the vessels 
really what was taking place is that the tabernacle was being cleansed on the outside because of the, the flesh, that which is external. But sin defiles more than just your flesh. You know it and I know it. Sin will mar your body. There are people who are listening and their bodies have been marred and, and defiled by sin. But sin stains the conscience so that even when you stop sinning, it bothers you. So that even when you turn your life around, you still have to answer for the things in the past. And you remember that's on your conscience. The way I treated people, the way I responded to the gospel, the things I said about so-and-so, the things I took into my body, the acts that I performed with other people, all of these things bother me. It's a stain on my conscience and you're constantly trying to erase that which cannot be erased, but God says, come now. Let us reason together. Though your sins be as a stain of scarlet, I'll cleanse them white as snow. White as snow. I live in Prince Edward Island where the snow is still white when it comes down out of the sky. I'm not sure what it looks like where you live. It gets dirty after a while when the old wind blows around and this and that. But that fresh fall of snow, beautiful, isn't it? I've been up Taylor's Gulch, right? There in Fordo. You get halfway up. Mr. Meekin and myself used to snowshoe up there every day. And we'd be up there and we'd just stop and look around. And if the wind wasn't blowing, we'd even take off our hat and we'd take a peek. And just the whiteness of a fresh fall of snow. It's pure, isn't it? It's clean. It is sparkling. God wants to take your conscience and erase every sin so that your conscience can be absolutely purged and white as snow. That means you don't have to worry about the sins that you've done in the past if you come now. now I'm not sure if I can make that any more attractive than I just did. But our prayer is that God will reveal something to you that I can't. They shall be white as snow. But now it says, though they be red, like crimson. You say red and scarlet, same thing. Yeah, it's the same color. But now he's talking about the glaring aspect. It's the idea of all around, kind of a drabness or even a whiteness. And right in the middle, sticking out like a sore thumb that cannot be avoided is this glaring crimson red stain. Something that is, is just crying out to be addressed. Something that cannot be overlooked. Something that marks this person as being defiled. Something that, that points them out as being a sinner. And with that demarcation comes shame. I don't know if you feel shame for your sin. But you should. Oh, well, everybody sins. Everybody sins. But remember, your sin is like a glaring red mark in the presence of God. As God looks down, he doesn't see you like I see you. He doesn't see you like you see you. You see, you're looking around and you're looking at everybody else and saying, okay, that person does this and 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 I do this. We all sin. I'm a sinner just like everybody else and we're all just carrying on trying to get along together, right? You go to your church and I go to mine and we'll all try to get along just fine. But listen, it doesn't matter how you see your sin. You're measuring by the wrong yardstick. It doesn't matter how I see your sin. Although if I read the Bible and I have the mind of Christ and I look in my Bible, I will see your sin as being serious. But it matters how God sees your sin. And when God looks down tonight, does he see someone with a glaring red stain that cannot be avoided, that 
cannot be overlooked? And do you feel any bit of shame connected with your sin? Oh, can I tell you something? The mouth of the Lord has said this. Come now. Come now and let's discuss your options. Though your sins be as scarlet, that stain that cannot be erased, I will make them as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson and glaring and shameful, they'll be as wool. What's that mean? Well, I don't believe that that means they're going to be white. Because sometimes wool is black. And sometimes wool is gray. And almost all the time, wool is dirty. But what does it mean? It means that just like when the, the, the shepherd comes and he takes the shears and removes the wool. Now, they've got really good tools nowadays for doing that, I'm sure. But I've seen freshly sheared sheep. They remove the wool, that which was weighing them down, that which was clinging to them, and that which was probably irritating them. They remove the wool stroke by stroke by stroke by stroke until it's all gone. Then they pick it up and they take it away. Now that might be coming back full circle to my oversimplistic theological dictionary. But that's the simple concept of what God wants to do with your sins. He wants to take them away. That glaring mark that he cannot overlook that's causing you shame in his presence. He wants to take it away. Now, I don't know what they do with the wool where you live. I was talking to them over in Parsons a couple of months ago, months ago now. Time has flown, hasn't it? Looking at Roger Gaines there, it's flown quite a time. But the boys over there told me that they used to ship the wool to PEI. And just down the road here, I could take you if, if you were allowed to come to PEI. I'd take you just down the road. McCausland's woolen mill is still there. And they're still processing wool. And if you have some sheep and you want to send your wool, go ahead and do it. But they would send it away. Now, uh, some people were telling me that their mother would send the, the wool away to PEI. It would be put into yarn and it would be put in, in balls or in, into uh, bunches and sent back and mom would make mitts and socks it was hard to keep the kids in the socks those days I guess they went through them a lot but the sheep never saw that wool again it was taken away come now and let us reason together saith the Lord Though your sins be as scarlet, cleansed as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they'll be taken away. Never to be seen again. Now, I'm not sure, but I see a lot of smiling faces. The people I can see. You know why? Because they know how wonderful it is to, be have, to have a perfectly cleansed conscience. Do we still sin? Shame on us, we do. According to the Bible, we don't have a conscience that's stained because the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. Do we still sin and are we ashamed when we do? Absolutely. But remember, God has taken away our sins. Past, present, and future. And there's a lot of things now that you can smile about. It's 7.31, but if I keep you late tonight, you can't protest by skipping meeting tomorrow night. It's the last one. Past, present, and future. I can't think of anything that's going on right now that would bring me more joy, if I was you, than to know that all my sins are taken away and my conscience is cleansed and I'm right with God and I'm going to experience the, the blessing. I've experienced everything that God has to offer. I know they're going to open up your province and you're going to be able to go out for a hamburger and sit down in the restaurant. whoop de doo I'm not going. But wouldn't you like to have your sins forgiven? <laughs> the mouth of the Lord has spoken this. Come now. 
Let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Let's pray. Our Father, we are thankful to thee for the activity of the Spirit of God in the gospel. We thank thee that though weak, we know that God can work through us in the preaching of the gospel. We would just long to be able to witness God working tonight and that a sinner would be willing and obedient, bow to the word of God and receive the blessing. We know that eight weeks have come and gone quickly. We know that much has occurred. We fear that many people have gotten used to things being this way and the jarring uh, jolt of the, the sudden shutdown has been lost in the minds of many. But if God applies this word to their conscience, we know that there will be fruit. So we ask thee for this. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen.